few more coming. Pardon me? Yes. That's an interesting noise. Ezekiel's here now. Pardon me? I've never been attacked yet. It's lots of talk now. <laughs> <laughs> So, so we have to be out of this room by 3.15, so I think we should go ahead and get started because I know Ashley's anxious to get started. Um, you know, all these that I've done as a mentor, it's always an, an exhilarating and a terrifying day for both the mentor and the candidate. So, uh, but um, I need to give you a brief background on uh, Ashley, who just pointed out she's never given a talk here at Drexel. She's done lots in South Carolina now, though. But um, before we go there, though, there'll be uh, she'll give her talk. There'll be questions from the general audience, and then after that, the committee will adjourn to uh, room 103 for further questioning. And then uh, sometime after that, maybe four o'clock, maybe 4:30, there'll be either a celebration or condolences <laughs> on the fourth floor collaboratory, uh, thanks to Jasmine's help. So um, just a brief background on uh, Ashley. So she did her undergraduate at Adrian College and majored in biology and Japanese studies. And she came to Drexel shortly thereafter, started in 2010 as a master's student. And I lose track of time, so it was either 2011 or 2012 that she moved to the PhD program and joined my lab. Uh, and that really made me uh, have a perfect record of failure in graduating master's students, because I still have had all of them move to the PhD program. Uh, but um, at any rate, Ashley, since she's been in the lab, has had uh, three papers, one book chapter. The book chapter is chapter one of her thesis. Chapter two of her thesis, she's going to tell you about now. Um, it's a paper that was published this summer. It actually got some news out. Um, I can't read this, but I can see that it says Twist in Kalinsky there. Uh, but uh, it's featured in several news outlets from a, a press release from the university. But more importantly, though, uh, the journal featured it on the front cover, so, um, which I think testifies to the quality of her work. And uh, without further ado, I'll let her tell us what she's been doing. And I'll get rid of this. So. Hopefully that will. Okay. Let's just hit. Okay. So thank you, Jeff, for that introduction. I want to thank everybody for taking the time out of their day to come here and hear what I have to say. So I'm excited to share with you what I've been working on for the past five years since, as Jeff mentioned, nobody really knows what I've been up to. Um, so uh, the talk is going to be broke down into two different parts. The first part is going to be what we published in the Journal of Neuroscience this summer that focuses on traditional themes of the lab, so neural repair and mRNA localization and local protein synthesis and axons. And then the second half of the talk was a side project that really took off recently. So it's incomplete, but we have some really exciting data, so I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. So I know most, a lot of you are neuroscientists in this room, so you're familiar with this. Um, but I just want to point out a couple of things. So our lab is interested in the biology of mature 
neurons, and specifically in uh, neural repair and axon regeneration. So the axon is responsible for long distance communication because the target can be up to a meter away from the cell body. And so when the um, communication between the cell body and the target is severed, this can lead to functional deficits. These likely are permanent, such as in cases of spinal cord injury. So how do we actually study the biology of an axon? Well, the axon can act independently of the cell body, meaning that it can respond to the extracellular environment before the cell body has a chance to respond. And a way that it does this is by having the proteins that it needs made at the site that it's needed, such as a synapse, for example. And the way that this occurs is through mRNA localization. So um, mRNA localization is an evolutionary conserved mechanism that many cells use to maintain and establish subcellular domains. And so this is extremely important during polarization events, all the way from budding yeast even into neurons. And so the proteins that are made in dendrites, uh, we know are responsible for synaptic plasticity. This is very well established. However, the idea that axons can synthesize proteins locally has been a lot harder to prove. And some people even believe that it does not occur, as you can see from this textbook here, where it says ribosomes are excluded from mature axons, which would render them incapable of synthesizing proteins locally. However, um, people didn't really agree with that. And so since um, in the 1960s or so, uh, some groups showed that invertebrate axons can synthesize proteins locally in axons. But it was thought since there's, they show incomplete polarization that they're partially dendritic. So this would not be the case for a vertebrate axon. Um, since then, uh, Stewart and Levy had a landmark paper in the 1980s, and they detected ribosomes at the base of dendritic spines, but they failed to detect ribosomes in mature axons. So it kind of stuck in the field that axons could not synthesize proteins locally. Um, however, since then, a lot of groups have shown this in uh, developing axons, and then our lab, among many others, has shown that uh, local protein synthesis in axons is uh, important for axon growth and regeneration, specifically in the adult peripheral nervous system. And we've made so much progress that even in the 2016 edition, they are saying that there might be few ribosomes in axons, so we're getting somewhere, which is exciting. <laughs> so very briefly, um, the, peripheral ner the nervous system can be broken up into two parts, the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which is the rest. So I'll refer to them as the CNS and PNS, respectively. Um, very briefly, the axonally targeted mRNAs are translated at the site of injury in axons. And these proteins here are needed to form the growth cone after injury, which is an essential step in regeneration. And then other proteins are used to form retrograde injury signaling complexes. They'll uh, go back to the cell body, elicit changes in gene transcription, and this will maintain the regeneration response. And so this in combination with the peripheral nervous, uh, with the permissive environment of the peripheral nervous system supports axon regeneration, among other things, but these are what I'm uh, focusing on. Um, however, in the central nervous system, axons do not regenerate very well, or at all. And there's a couple of reasons for this. So one reason is that they have a lower intrinsic growth capacity. And one group looked at this where, from James Fawcett's lab in 2005, they thought that since uh, CNS axons do not regenerate well in vivo, it's because they don't synthesize proteins locally. They don't have as much translational machinery there. And so they compared uh, axon or the formation of a growth cone after injury between the peripheral nervous system, looking at adult, uh, embryonic and adult dorsal root ganglion neurons. These are part of the peripheral nervous system. They compared that to retinal ganglion cells, or RGCs, which are part of the central nervous system. And then they did an in vitro axonomy. And what you can see for the DRGs, after um, axonomy, they regenerate a growth cone very well. If you block protein synthesis or protein degradation, that significantly um, inhibits the regeneration. However, if you look at the RGC axons, they really don't regenerate that well at all. And then if you block protein synthesis or protein degradation, it really has little effect. So further suggesting that they don't have as much translational machinery in RGC neurons. When they looked at that, they looked at ribosomal protein P0, and you can see there's significantly less ribosomal protein P0 in RGC axons compared to DRG axons. So further pointing out that the, the intrinsic capacity of, of these CNS axons are, is lower than the PNS. But that's not the only reason why they, the CNS fails to regenerate. A lot of it has to do with a very inhibitory environment, and specifically after spinal cord injury. So after spinal cord injury, there are many cellular and molecular changes that cause axon degeneration, myelin degradation, a lot of glial and 
uh, inflammatory cell responses, and the formation of what we call a glial scar. And so this is a mixture of um, in reactive astrocytes and inhibitory extracellular matrix proteins. And so while the DRG cell bodies, which lie just outside the spinal cord, they survive relatively well after spinal cord injury. Um, within a few days, the cut axons form an end bulb structure, which is the uh, hallmark of regeneration failure, which you can see here. And so this data is taken from Jerry Silver's lab. They very nicely show um, transplanted GFP-positive DRG axons growing towards a spinal cord injury site. And the takeaway message from this is that the axons do not cross this lesion site here. Few of them make it to the lesion site, but none of them cross the other side, and that's because it's very inhibitory. And so the question was, is this glial scar just a biochemical and physical barrier to regeneration? Or, like what was suggested before, um, is the intrinsic capacity of the CNS that much less than the PNS, and that's also why they don't regenerate. Um, so a way to look at this is to study CNS axons that are actually regenerating. And so I keep saying that they don't regenerate, but they can in fact be coaxed to regenerate. And there's several ways to do this. Um, a way that's gotten a lot of attention recently is through the use of stem cell grafts. But one way that's been around since the 1980s is the use of a peripheral nerve graft. So David, a guy on Richardson, were one of the first to show this back in the 80s, where they would take a peripheral nerve, graft it into a transected spinal cord, and axons regenerate into the graft. And that's because it has a very permissive environment. Um, part of that has to do with the activated Schwann cells, which are secreting neurotrophins. They also have these cylinders of laminin that the axons can grow into. And so in collaboration with John Blais' lab, we use a system in their lab where they take a pre-degenerated tibial nerve and they graft it into a transected spinal cord, attached either at the caudal end or the rostral end, so we can study ascending sensory axons or descending motor axons, respectively. And then they'll leave the other side unopposed, so there's no re into the cord. Um, at the time points that we were interested, at three weeks post-grafting, the axons are actively growing into the graft, and we focused on the ascending sensory axons. Um, and if we take the tissue section from here and we stain for neurofilament cocktails, you can see the axons growing into the graft very nicely, although I'll show you we optimize this a little bit more. And so what the goal of... This part of my thesis work was, was to ask if under these permissive growth conditions where CNS axons are actively regenerating, can they localize mRNA? Do they have protein synthesis machinery? So are they capable of synthesizing proteins? And to what extent is this happening? Can we compare it to the peripheral nervous system? So are they localizing mRNA and synthesizing proteins to the same extent as uh, regenerating peripheral nerves? And so in order to do this, we're very interested in mRNA localization, but it was important that we picked targets that we thought would be activated by both a central injury and a peripheral nerve injury. And so going through some RNA profiling studies done by Mike Fainzelberg's group, Mark Zinzinski's group, we found two mRNAs, Reg3A and HAMP, that were significantly upregulated in the DRG cell bodies after spinal cord injury and after sciatic nerve injury. And this is valuable because the DRG cell body lies just outside the spinal cord. It has two processes, one that goes into the spinal cord, one that forms the sciatic nerve. So if you injure the spinal cord, that cell body is affected. If you injure the sciatic nerve, the same cell body is affected. So they seem to respond to both types of injury. And little is known about them. Um, we also looked at another um, study done in collaboration with Mike Fainzelberg, and they both seem dependent on STAT3, which is important for PNS axon regeneration. Um, reg a or PAP2, as it's called in the rat, is part of the C-type lectin family of secretory proteins. It's involved in islet cell regeneration. Um, its expression is induced with sciatic nerve injury and inflammation, although its role in axons is not known. Um, HAMP encodes the small uh, peptide hepcidin. It's involved in iron metabolism, and it's mediated by STAT3, and its role in axons is unknown. So we had some preliminary data that suggested they were axonal, so it made them very interesting targets for our study. So the first thing that we wanted to do was see if their localization in axons changes with peripheral nerve injury. So in order to do this with help of a postdoc in the lab, Cynthia Gomes, we performed a unilateral sciatic nerve crush, and then we harvested the DRG seven days, an injured phenotype from the one that we injured the sciatic nerve, and then a naive or uninjured phenotype from the other side. And then we cultured these DRG neurons, and these are all from adults, so everything I'll talk about from here on out is adult neurons. Um, and then we did in situ hybridization, and we quantified how much RNA was in the axons. And you can see that for Reg3A and HAMP, they're significantly increased in the axons with injury. 
We also looked at another mRNA, important beta-1. This um, mRNA is constitutively found in pianus axons. Um, it's translationally re regulated after injury. When it's translated, it's involved in the retrograde injury signaling complexes, so it's important for regeneration. And what we found is we see no significant change in levels in the axons with injury. And so we know that this change in localization could be due to a shift from the cell body to the axon, or it could be due to an increased amount of RNA in the cell body, which makes it more available to transport to the axon. And so to do this, with another help of a postdoc in the lab, Song Ju Lee, who did a sciatic nerve crush, he harvested DRGs at three days, seven days, 14 days, and 28 days after injury. And then he performed a quantitative digital droplet PCR, where I could get absolute levels of mRNA. And so these are in the DRG cell bodies. And you can see that for Reg3A and HAMP, they're significantly increased three days after injury. This seems to be maintained for HAMP across the entire time course. And we see a similar trend for Reg3A. Um, not surprisingly, we see no change in important beta-1 levels at any of the time points after injury in the cell body. And so this was really exciting. It seems that both Reg3A and HAMP are responding to this injury. They could be regeneration-associated genes. But we wanted to move this in vivo so that we could compare it to the axons that were regenerating into the peripheral nerve graph so we could compare between the PNS and the CNS. And so in order to do this, we took tissue sections from naive sciatic nerve or uninjured, from the injured sciatic nerve, and from the three-week ascending peripheral nerve graphs. So we have an uninjured model, a PNS injury model, and a CNS injury model. And so to identify mRNAs in these tissue sections, we did uh, quantitative in situ hybridization. And because the tissue sections were treated a little bit differently, we wanted to get a really accurate representation, or at least to the best that we could, of how these axons are responding to the injury and where, how much RNA is localizing. And so in order to do this, we took large tile scans. So each one of these is 100 by 100 microns. So this is 400 microns this way and 100 micro, or 300 microns this way. And this is an XYZ projection. So it's a stack about 3.7 microns in thickness. And that's why we can make sure that we're seeing mRNA that's inside the axoplasm and not above or below. And so the mRNA for Reg3A you can see here in red, the axons are in green, and we detected the axons through a cocktail of neurofilaments, and a regeneration marker, SCG10, is shown to mark regenerating axons in the optic nerve very well. It's also called Staphman 2. And then you can see the non-neuronal cells in blue here. And so we noticed from our in vitro data that none of these targets were neuronal specific. And so that makes quantitation very complicated in vivo. And what you can see here is we have signal on the axons here, but we also have signal coming from these non-neuronal cells. And so we wanted to remove that signal so we could quantify only the mRNA that was in the axons. So to do this, we use a plug-in from ImageJ where you give it a two-color channel. In this case, our axons are always in green and our mRNA is in red. So I highlighted a signal that's in the axons here, and then this is non-neuronal signal, just the DAPI is removed. And when you put it through the plug-in, it gives you a new image where the axon only mRNA signal is. So all that non-neuronal signal is gone. Um, I'm displaying this as a spectral image, although it's not the raw intensity of the RNA, and that's important. So this is normalized to the intensity of the axon channel. So this allows us to account for changes in axon volume and changes in intensity, so we can normalize to that. So it's a good internal control. And so if we remerge that with, the ac uh, with just the axons, you can see all the non-neuronal signal is gone. And if we project this again, you can see there's no non-neuronal signal here. But we can see beautiful signal coming from the axon here. And so we were very tedious about this. It took a very long time. But we did this through every optical plane that we had. And that was important because we wanted to make sure we were getting only the signal that was coming from the axons, not squished from the non-neuronal cells above or below. And so this allowed us to quantitate it. Um, we did notice that the signal was granular, but for you to really appreciate that, we took high magnification images, and this allowed us to compare between um, different tissue sections. So it's important that I make a distinction here and that we're only comparing between different tissue types for a single mRNA. We can't compare between different mRNAs. So you can't compare the levels of Reg3A with HAMP, but you can compare the levels of Reg3A in the knife to crush peripheral nerve, where we can see a nice increase and then again to the peripheral nerve graft. And so what we can see from this is we see a similar increase in the axons um, in the injured peripheral nerve that we saw in vitro. And interestingly, we do see really nice signal in the peripheral nerve grafts, suggesting it looks like it's above 
the levels of the night peripheral nerve. So this is really important that we quantitate this. And so the way that we did this was we first took in a traditional approach to quantitate this, where we quantify the levels of mRNA by doing the uh, pixels per micron squared. And so we did this by using the subtracted image, so they're first normalized to the intensity of the neurofilament and SCG10 markers. But then we also normalized it to the total area that the axons took up. And that was important because we noticed varying levels of axons in each of the tissue sections, and we wanted to control for that as well. And so what we see finally here is when we uh, show a full change to the niacinic nerve, is that we see increases for Reg3A and HAMP with the peripheral nerve injury, similar to what we saw in vitro. Um, but surprisingly, we see this increase for Reg3A and important beta-1 in the axons in the spinal cord uh, model. And so these, obviously the error bars are humongous, but it didn't really tell us everything that we wanted to know. And when we looked back at the tile scans, we noticed that there was a varying distribution of mRNA intensity in each axon and then in between axons. So some axons had a lot of RNA signal, other axons didn't have any signal at all. And so we wanted to do a population analysis where we could see how many of the axons had mRNA signal. And I'm not sure anybody has looked at this before, and so we thought this would be a good approach. And that's what I'm showing you here. And so we counted all of the axons in the tissue sections, and then we counted how many of them had overlapping mRNA signal. And what we see is the same thing for the overall RNA levels, is that we see significant increases for Reg3A and HAMP with peripheral nerve injury, and this is still maintained with Reg3A, however, um, in the spinal cord model, um, but for HAMP, those levels drop back down to the naive peripheral nerve. And this suggests that maybe Reg3A is responding to that central injury more so than HAMP is. And not surprisingly, we don't see any significant change with important beta-1. A little bit of a change with injury, but that could be because it's in vivo compared to our in vitro model. And so this was really exciting that we were able to even show this for, at all. Um, but we don't know what Reg3A and HAMP are doing. We don't know what their role is. They seem to be associated with regeneration, but we don't really know. And so we wanted to ask if other mRNAs that we know are involved in axon growth and regeneration in the peripheral nervous system, how they are responding in the spinal cord injury model. So um, the co-first author on the paper, Raul Sachseva from John Hulay's lab, asked if GAT43, Neuritin, and beta-axin mRNAs are localizing in the um, ascending peripheral nerve graft axons. And what you can see is we see the varying uh, changes with total RNA levels, but with the percent of axons that are containing the mRNA, we see significant increases with both peripheral nerve injury and in the ascending peripheral nerve grafts. So suggesting that these mRNAs might have similar roles in the CNS that they do in the PNS. Um, so that was really, really exciting. Um, however, it does not answer the question if these axons can synthesize proteins, and that's ultimately very important to know. So to order to ask that, we looked for evidence of protein synthesis. And to do this, we looked at cap-dependent translation, we looked at um, inhibiting factors and activating factors that were regulated by phosphorylation. We also looked for evidence of ribosomes through uh, the Y10B antibody, which is a marker for a ribosomal RNA. And then for uh, phospho S6, which is part of the 40S subunit. So I'll show you the data for 4ABP1 and then for the ribosomes today. And so these panels are huge, and so I apologize, they're a little distracting. But what I want you to focus on is just the subtracted image. So what I did here was the same thing I did for the RNA. I subtracted out the protein that was overlapping with the axon. So that's what you can see here. And we have naive sciatic nerve, injured sciatic nerve, and the peripheral nerve grafts. And what we can see, look at specifically for phospho 4 bp one because when uh, 4 bp one is phosphorylated, indicates translation is occurring. And what you can see is signals that are above, or at least comparable to, what we see in the injured sciatic nerve, which is above the levels, at least we think, of the naive um, peripheral nerve, suggesting that translation is, is likely occurring here. The same thing for the ribosomal proteins. We can see beautiful signals for phospho-S6 and for Y10B in the peripheral nerve grafts that seem very comparable to what we see in the injured sciatic nerve. So this was really exciting. It really indicates that translation is likely occurring. And so um, to conclude this part of the talk, this is the first time we have been able to show that CNS axons that are regenerating to peripheral nerve grafts or regenerating CNS axons are localizing mRNA. 
seems to be for some transcripts at the same extent that it's regenerating in the peripheral nerve, and there's likely uh, protein synthesis occurring. And this is a potential me mechanism to target for spinal cord injury therapy because it's an endogenous mechanism. It suggests that these axons under the right conditions are inherently capable of regenerating. They just need a little coaxing. And this might be part of the reason why they can regenerate. And so we are very excited that we were able to publish this in Journal of Neuroscience this summer. So the second half of my talk. So this we're going to switch gears a little bit here because um, we know that it's exciting that we can show that RNA is localizing and uh, protein synthesis is occurring in this PNG model system. But we need to know if this can occur in the normal physiological environment. Can axons overcome their inhibitory environment and, and regenerate? So in order to, to look at this, we wanted to see if we could manipulate the axon to grow in, in a non-permissive environment. And for this, we're going to focus on uh, the cytoskeleton and axon transport. And so how do we do this? Well, to do this, we turn to HDACs, histone deacetylases. And so histone deacetylases do not just deacetylate histones. A lot of them have cytoplasmic targets, and they have roles in axon growth and regeneration. And so one in particular that's got a lot of attention recently is HDAC5, and the Cavalli group has showed elegantly its role in regeneration, specifically its nuclear export and its uh, tubulin deacetylase activity in the uh, PNS um, after injury. But there's another histone deacetylase that shame, shares the same uh, target as HDAC5, and actually if you inhibit HDAC6, it promotes growth on inhibitory substrates. And so HDAC6 is a class 2B deacetylase, and it is solely cytoplasmic. It doesn't actually deacetylate histones under normal conditions. Um, and it's involved in a variety of processes from uh, protein degradation to cell motility. Um, and if you overexpress HDX6 in adult DRG neurons, you can see it localizes heavily to the growth cone. And the reason why we're so interested in it is in collaboration with Brett Langley's group, they show that if you inhibit HDX6, axons normally retract from inhibitory substrates such as MAG and CSPGs, similar things that prevent axon growth after spinal cord injury. But if you inhibit HX6, they can grow in the presence of that same inhibitory substrate. Also, it appears to be neuroprotective, at least from oxidative stress. So it's a very interesting target, especially in terms of axon growth and regeneration. And so we wanted to understand how is this working? So what's the function of HX6 in the axon? Or at least what's happening when you inhibit it? And so um, while we were working on this, uh, George Smith and Peter Boss actually showed that if you inhibit HDX6 for 24 hours, it inhibits growth of DRG axons, or decreases growth of DRG axons, I should say. Um, but that's with 24 hours of treatment. And what Britt Langley showed is that it was protective within one hour of treatment. And so we wanted to ask if it affected axon length within one hour of treatment. So what I did here was I cultured DRG neurons on laminin for 24 hours, and then I inhibited HDX6 with a specific uh, histone uh, with a specific HDX6 inhibitor um, for one hour. And what you can see is the uh, length of DRG axons is not affected at this time point. However, what is affected is the growth cone area. So under normal conditions, this is what the growth cones typically look like. They're growing. They're happy, but with uh, tubostatin A, which is the inhibitor, you can see their growth cone area increases dramatically. Uh, drastically. Um, and this is about a two-fold increase. And so I asked, how quickly is this occurring? And so if we did live, when I did live cell imaging, you can see that the area of the growth cone increases around 20 minutes, but increases about two-fold by 40 minutes. So this is a very rapid effect that is happening. And so this is very interesting, that it's specifically affecting the growth cone, but it's not affecting um, DRG length. And so I wanted to understand what was going on more. And so the growth cone is very, yes? What substrate are you growing on? Laminin. Yeah. So first some permissive substrates. Um, and so uh, we're interested in the growth cone. It's the most terminal structure of the axon. It's important for guiding an axon to its proper target. So it does this by responding to attractive cues and turning away from repulsive cues. And the way that it does this is through tight regulation of the growth cone. You can see a peripheral region of actin. This forms the lamellopodia and the philopodia structures that sort of probe the environment. And then you have a few dynamic microtubules or tyrosinated microtubules that invade these actin regions. 
but stable microtubules uh, terminate at the axon shaft and they don't enter the growth cone. So it's very tightly regulated. So we wanted to ask what was going on in the growth cone. And so the Bradkey group a few years ago showed that stabilization of the growth cone can be protective of or promote growth on inhibitory substrate. And they use Taxol to show this, which is a microtubule stabilizing drug. And so we wanted to ask what post-translational modifications are affected by HX6 inhibition because HX6 is a tubulin deacetylase. If you deacetylate or if you block the deacetylase, you should get increase in acetylation of tubulin. And so first I did a Western block where I lysed uh, DRG neurons, um, whole cells, and then just their axons. And what you can see, well, we don't see any overall change of acetylated tubulin levels. We see a specific increase of acetylated tubulin in the axons themselves. So not overall, but specifically in the axon. So I wanted to know where that increase was occurring. Um, <laughs> so I stayed in DRG neurons that had been treated with a control or tubostatin A for one hour. Um, for beta tubulin, tyrosinated alpha tubulin, acetylated alpha tubulin, and F-actin. And then I broke down a quantification of their axons into three parts. So I quantified the most proximal 50 microns, which is closest to the cell body, the most distal 50 microns, which is closest to the growth cone, and then the growth cone itself. So I could figure out where the spatial increase was occurring. And what you can see is we see a significant increase of acetylated tubulin levels in the growth cone, where we see a significant decrease in effactin, which was interesting, and we don't see any change with tyrosinated alpha tubulin. So this is suggesting that, the, um, that tyrosinated uh, levels are not affected, but specifically acetylated tubulin is affected, and it appears that effactin is also affected, but specifically in the growth cone. So if we look at this more closely, I took, uh, used the confocal to do 3D reconstruction here, and you can see in green, acetylated alpha tubulin filling the growth cone. So under normal conditions, this does not occur, but here you can see it filling the growth cone. If we look at the plot profiles, you can clearly see that there's an increase in acetylated tubulin levels in the distal axon in the growth cone, where we see a uh, decrease in F-actin compared to controls. So really suggesting that it's a spatially restricted effect. So HX6 inhibition is specifically affecting the distal axon in the growth cone. So since HX6 is a uh, cytoplasmic uh, histone deacetylase, we asked if other known targets, ones that we know localized to the growth cone, are also affected, since that seems to be where the biggest effect is. Um, so a student in the lab looked at uh, levels of acetylated HSP90, or heat shock protein 90, and you can see that there's a significant increase of H acetylated HSP90 levels in the growth cone. Uh, we see a similar effect with those acetylated cortactin levels, Cortactin is also found in the growth cone, but uh, it wasn't significant. But the, the takeaway message from this is likely, HX6 likely has many axonal targets, and it's going to be very important to identify what those are, and specifically which ones are affecting the growth cone. Maybe it can explain why this is a protective effect. So, since we are modifying the cytoskeleton a little bit, modifying the post-translational modifications, we know that molecular motors, kinesin, which move anterogradely, and dynein, which move retrogradely, are influenced by post-translational modifications. Some of them prefer more stable or acetylated microtubules. Other ones prefer more dynamic or tyrosinated microtubules. And since we're affecting that, we assumed that transport could also be affected. Um, very recently, some groups have shown that uh, movement of mitochondria is affected by HX6 inhibition. So we wanted to ask the same thing. Under these conditions where DRG neurons are cultured on a permissive substrate, laminin, um, is transport of mitochondria affected? And so, in order to look at mitochondrial dynamics, I used a mito tracker. So, I stained uh, DRG neurons with mito tracker and then I began live cell imaging. And here's a chymograph for our baseline imaging where anterograde movement is this direction, retrograde movement is going this way. This is the time and the distance. And so, the black lines that are moving this way are anterogradely moving mitochondria. If they're straight, they're not moving at all. And if they're moving this direction, they're retrogradely moving. And so it was important for me to look at the same axon before and after inhibition. And so I imaged for my baseline, and then I added the HX6 inhibitor. I began imaging, and then I imaged one hour later. So I could see the effects within the short time point. And what we can see by the chymograph, sort of, is that there's an increase in anterograde movement, or at least movement 
in general. Um, we don't look at chymographs in our lab, so they're a little tough for me to interpret and really understand. So I used a particle tracking from Velocity and MHJ to sort of break down this a little bit further. Um, if we look at velocity with anterogradely moving vesicles, which are in blue, and in yellow are retrograde moving, and we group these before treatment, immediately after treatment, and one hour after treatment, we can see it's not affecting velocity at all. So they're moving at the same rates. I assumed that that would have been the first thing that was affected, the rate of the mitochondria. Um, but there's no effect there. But what we do see is an overall net increase in enterograde movement. So more mitochondria are moving towards the growth cone. And subsequently, we see a significant increase in the number of mitochondria in the growth cones of the HX6 inhibited neurons, which you can see clearly here. So there's more mitochondria in the growth cones compared to the control. And so I wanted to ask if there is a reason for this. So what are those mitochondria doing? And so to do this, I turned to chromophore-assisted light activation. And this uses a killer red protein fused to mitochondria. This is a killer red here. And if you hit this killer red with uh, green light, it will cause an electron transfer and release reactive oxygen species from the mitochondria. Um, so this is a fantastic way to sort of injure the mitochondria in a specific area that we're interested in. So you can do this to the whole cell and eventually kill the whole cell, or you can do it to a specific location. In this case, we're interested in the growth cone because that's where we saw all the changes. And so I transfected DRG neurons with a blue fluorescent protein, which you can see in blue, so I could just see them, and then I transfected them with the killer mito red, or the, the, the mito killer red, and then I bleached out the growth cone with green light until there was no signal. And if we do this to the control and the ones that have been inhibited by, uh, have uh, been treated with tubostatin A for one hour, you can see we bleach out the signal completely, takes a while, and then you can track. Um, the mitochondria that move into the growth cone for the HX6 inhibited ones and the control cultures actually retract. And so if we break this into stills so you can see it a little bit better, 85% of the control cultures showed growth cone retraction, which you can see here, within 15 minutes after um, the killer red activation. 15% of them did not retract. However, we saw no recovery of mitochondria into the bleached region, so there was no net movements of mitochondria that direction. Um, with the ones that we treated with tubostatin A for one hour, you can see 85% uh, of them did not retract, but all of them showed um, increased movement into the bleach region. So we can see that by the recovery here. So we see significant recovery of mitochondria signal in the growth cones with tubostatin A treatment. This is compared to the controls as well, compared to the bleach times zero. While 15% of them did retract, it was significantly less than that of the control cultures. So they only retracted uh, about one and a half microns compared to the control cultures, which had a drastic retraction of about 10 microns. And so this was really interesting. Um, it seems that HX6 is, in fact, neuroprotective of whatever is happening from these mitochondria. And so this transient inhibition of HX6 is likely neuroprotective, similar to what Bright Langley has shown, could be due to the stabilization of the growth cone. And what I mean by that is the increase in the cetylated microtubules in the growth cone could be from increased mitochondrial transport, or maybe an enhanced function. And so I didn't um, finish addressing that, but that's what I plan on doing before my postdoc, is figuring out what, in fact, um, the mitochondria are doing. Is there less reactive oxygen species that are being released from the mitochondria? Is there something else that's activated? Do they have increased ATP production or oxidative phosphorylation? I don't know. But I plan on trying to answer that. But what I think really is the, the takeaway from my, all of my thesis work is that people generally focus on the um, pathways that are activated by the environment onto the axon and then the intrinsic capacity of the neuron themselves. But what my work suggests is that these converge on the distal axon. There's something that's happening locally from both the environment and both from the intrinsic nature of the axon. And if we hit the right pathways, we can increase regeneration. I think we can do this in the CNS as well. And so with that, I'd like to thank everybody who has been so helpful, um, specifically Jeff, my mentor, who definitely took a chance on me when I started as a master's student with no experience. Um, but he's been really supportive and uh, challenging, of course, but it's been great working for him. Uh, some postdocs in the lab, Cynthia and June, who helped me with the neuroscience paper, and of course, 
our collaborators, John and Raul, who without them, that paper would have never come to. Um, I also had some fantastic students. Uh, Paul, who is a postdoc student, John and Zalek, who are undergraduates and absolutely fantastic, and I will be so sad when they don't work for me anymore. Um, my thesis committee, John, Elias, Felice, and Bob, who always made time to have my meetings and were very easy to work with and stuck with me the whole time I was at USC. Um, and then all of our collaborators, Brett and Mike, Larry and Matt, who I, I really enjoy working with. Um, and everybody at South Carolina, they kind of took me in as their own students and made me feel very welcomed. And of course, all of our funding, Jeff makes sure that we can do what we want to do. And then my family, who I would never be here without them. Okay, sure. Yes. John. So first, uh, that, that was really a good job. Thank you. Um, so I, I want to ask a question about the first part of your talk. Okay. And you showed that in um, either peripheral neuroaxons that have an intrinsic ability to regenerate, you see the, the, the movement of, and or the presence of mRNA particles in the axon. Yeah. You see the same for central nervous system axons when they're in an environment that allows them to regenerate. Yes. Okay. In central nervous system axons that are not in that environment, in vivo, is it, is it the inability of the ribosome mRNA particle to translate, to move down the axon? Is that why you don't see it? Is there something that is perturbing the motor proteins, something along those lines? Okay, so the question is what happens in the non-permissive conditions, why, why they're not localizing? Well, we did look right at sort of where the, the, they attach the graft to the spinal cord, and we do see a similar pattern of mRNA localization at that point, but they are regenerating into the graft. At least we assume they're the same ones that are going into the graft. What I think is probably happening under no graft conditions and just an injured spinal cord, is likely there's probably some mRNA present, like I assume important beta-1 is probably there in case of an injury. Um, I think that there's some switch with the environment that either causes degradation of any machinery that's there or they're sequestered into a stress granule or something, but they're not available to be translated. I presume there's ribosomes still there. But everything is sort of at this silenced state, I guess I should I should say. Yes, Jen. I have two questions. So one, um, how specific is tubosetin A for HX6? The whole question is, how specific is tubosetin A for HX6? It's very specific. It's a structure-based inhibitor. Um, they have shown that it does, if you inhibit with HX6 at the levels that we did, there's no increase in histone acetylation, suggesting that it really is specific. Um, but it does bring a point that it could be affecting something else. Yeah. So then the other question I have is, you focus on trafficking of mitochondria. Presumably trafficking of other products is affected by HX6 inhibition. So could that be relevant to the neuroprotective mechanism you see with these Yes. So uh, the question is, what about other uh, transport of other vesicles? Yes, that's an excellent question. And we have started looking at that. So I've looked at um, late endosomes and uh, lysosomes, just acidic vesicles. Um, we do see altered movement of those. It's specific to each one. So we see increased retrograde transport of endosomes and increased anterograde transport of lysosomes, which is interesting. And if you inhibit HDAC6, it, it actually causes um, a failure of autophagosomes to fuse to lysosomes. So there could be something happening there. I'm not entirely sure why you would need more lysosomes in the growth home, but there might be some importance to that. <laughs> Thanks. Yes. I have a couple of questions. Uh, just to kind of Oh, so there was no injury with this. Okay. Yeah, so they're uninjured neurons. So, um, not, not the injury, the, the mitochondrial ablation technique. Oh, okay. So, um, 
The question is, when did I treat the tubostatin for the, the killer red experiments? So I cultured the neurons, transfected them. Um, 72 hours later, I added the tubostatin A, and then one hour later, I started the experiment. Okay, so close. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, another question I had was about the mRNAs that you chose to look at mm -hmm. in your first section of your law. Yeah. Um, you said that you didn't know, you know exactly what they were doing right? yeah. in uh, axonal generation, but um, do you know if they're required? That is, if you knock out either of them, can those axons still generate? Yes, that's an excellent question. So can some of the mRNAs that we looked at, uh, are they required for regeneration? And we're testing that now with Reg3A and HAMP. So I've generated siRNA against Reg3A and HAMP. And surprisingly, um, if you uh, knock down Reg3A, it increases axon length. Um, but if you knock down HAMP, it decreases axon length. So likely HAMP is probably supportive of regeneration, but there might be some inhibitory effect of Reg3A. So I'm trying to understand that now. But very good question. Yes, Denise. Uh, I just wanted to build on um, a little bit on your answer earlier, actually the John question. Mm -hmm. um, so you, for the uh, Reg3A and HAMP, you were talking about Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So the question is, where did we actually see the RNA in the grafts? How close to the spinal cord? And so um, since I didn't do the grafting myself, I apologize if I, if I have this wrong. Um, so we looked for the studies. We moved about 200 to 500 nanometers um, away from the edge of the grafts to do our studies so we could see single axons growing. But if you look right at the graft, I'm assuming very close to where it was attached, and Raul may be able to answer this better than I can. We did see signal in all of the axons that were in the graft at all. So, um, but I'm not sure how much of the, the spinal cord is actually there. Yeah, I don't think there's much spinal cord in that section that you got. Right, right. So presumably they're, they're mostly all in the, in the graft, but we did focus on where we could see single axons growing farther in the graft, not the cluster that are right there in the beginning. So I hope that answers your questions best I can do. Yes, Mike. So I'm wondering if you think it's the peripheral <coughs> environment, like there's some adhesion molecule or something, some extra matrix that's recruiting these RNAs more efficiently through receptor activation or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or you th if you think it's actually the permissive, maybe if it's the fact that the axons are growing that's um, recruiting or allowing the recruitment of the machinery. Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So um, is it the permissive environment because there's some communication between the environment or the, the axon, or if it's because the axon's growing? Um, I, I'd like to think that it's because the axon's actually growing. And so, of course, that is from the environment doing some sort of signaling pathway. But I think the active growth is what's important there. I think once we look at axons that have gotten to the end of the graft and stopped growing, we'd see a totally different pattern of localization. Um, I think there would be less mRNA there, probably less evidence of protein synthesis. So I think it's the active growth state that's important. So do you think if you do this experiment in, say, a Nova receptor knockout, where you yeah. can get growth through a normally non-permissive environment, do you think you'd see the global translation? Yeah, 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 I think I would. Um, we're, we're actually working with Mark Chizinski and his model system, so uh, where they do stem cell yeah. graphs, and we've got CST sections there. And so that's a completely different type of system where it's just permissive because of that, and, and we're detecting mRNAs there, but to the same extent, I don't know. But, yes. yes. You know what happens to your mRNAs that you looked at in your first part of your talk when you inhibit HDX? HDX. <laughs> That's a great question. So what about these mRNAs in the HDX6 uh, uh, inhibition? So that was originally the first thing I did. So I was like, all right, let's look at mRNA localization. And I got whacked out results. I have no idea what's happening. We saw increases for some, decreases in other. Nothing was very consistent. Um, so I kind of abandoned that. But um, it would be great to know if they were changing. Yes. So. Um, Yeah. 
uh, yeah, so um, if you inhibit HDAC5, it prevents axon regeneration. But if you inhibit HDAC6, it's, uh, I don't know if it promotes regeneration. We haven't looked. Um, but it supports growth on inhibitory substrates. So that's why we, we selected HDAC6 out of all the other ones. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess, do you know other components that are also work or against so together with HDAC6 to uh, create this phenotype? Yeah. I wouldn't think it's only the HDAC6 on itself that right. is going to be a whole year. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. So are there other... Uh, effects from HDAC6 inhibition that are affecting this. And we're working on that right now. So we're trying to identify all of the acetylated substrates um, in the axons under these conditions. And so we're generating constructs to do mass spec for that. It's been very difficult to identify the acetylated proteins. But likely, I think there's some influence from something else as well, especially with the inhibitor. Yes. So I guess my question kind of picks up on the mic. So when you look at the, 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 the axons in the permissive conditions, um, you see um, that you have movement of the um, granules and you see movement of the um, mitochondria, right? But the, the idea is that the permissive conditions outside might actually affect whether the intrinsic conditions in the axon are permissive. What's the communication between them? Do you see, do you see any sort of should you be synthesizing some cell surface proteins, receptors? Is there an ER movement in? Is there a sort of local production of cell surface proteins? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So um, it, there's differences in ER or cell surface proteins. Um, I, I haven't looked in these conditions. Um, presumably, yes, there, there would be. I mean, the, um, the permissive substrates are obvious, they're signaling through receptors. Um, so you, you definitely would see changes, especially because you need changes in, in membrane for growth and you need uh, changes in, um, in just about everything for that. So I assume that there, there are differences, and I think that it's very distinct depending on what environment that, that they're growing in. Um, uh, previous members in the lab have showed that different RNAs are a transport to the axons depending on what type of neurotrophins are there, and so very easily that will influence what's going on. Yeah. I guess my other question is sort of less about the ideas and more about just what it looks like. Uh, when you were showing the, the chymographs, there was more movement and more total amount of mitochondria. It also morphologically looked very different. Yes. Is it sort of, is it in a different state? Is it more active? Yeah, so... That, that's, a, that's a great question. So it's, it's crazy because the, the growth cones are so different in this. So not only is the axon different, but the mitochondria look very different as well. Um, at least, from my opinion, I think they're elongated. Um, but we need to do some EM studies to be sure. And if there is a, diff a change in the morphology of the mitochondria, that could answer um, if they have a different function. So if there's more fusion or more fission going on, um, we need to look at that and address that. But yeah, there's definitely a lot of morphological changes that are occurring. And I'm not sure where all of that is coming from. Well, I had one last question. Yeah. What are you going to do? What am I going to do? What are your plans? Well, I have a postdoc at the University of Michigan with Roman Geiger. That hopefully I'll be starting this winter, so I'm very excited for that. So um, I'll be switching over, doing some developmental work and some... Uh, looking at the interactions between non neuronal cells and the axon, so I'm very excited for that. Um, but from there, I don't know yet. <laughs> Fair enough. So, well, thank you, everybody.